Across the stars of the middle heavens, there are those unfortunate enough to fall victim to the species known as the Xenomorph XX121's destructive reproductive cycle. These individuals subjected to the horrors of the Xenomorph's Manumela noxhydria, colloquially known as the facehugger, are basically handed a death sentence of the most horrific and violent kind. A facehugger once attached to its host will implant a packet of mutagenic chemicals which quickly act to reorganise the host's very own cells, tissues and DNA, reconstructing and splicing their DNA with the pure DNA of the xenomorph through some kind of horizontal gene transfer, all leading to the creation of a plagiaris prepotent, or an embryonic chest burster which will ripen to eventually grow, rip and burst its way out of its host without mercy or hesitation. Anyone on the frontier unlucky enough to have this occur to them has surely got hell to look forward to, and nothing less. However, the question continuously posed to the project is whether or not it is possible to remove a chest burster before it has the chance to kill its host through the process of its birth. And the answer really depends on a lot of specific factors. But let me make this clear immediately. Your chances are not good. I think first it would be best to give you the examples we have of the records of survivors of the Xenomorph's chest bursters, and then work backwards explaining exactly how they were able to pull this off. The first recorded case of an individual being able to have their chest burster successfully removed without causing lasting harm to themselves, presumably, was that of Dr. Hollis. Dr. Hollis was not only able to survive her own chest burster, but she was actually the one to remove the creature surgically from herself. This feat was not easily obtained, and was truly a remarkable achievement. Dr. Hollis became infected and impregnated by a xenomorph facehugger around the year 2137, aboard the Wright Abera refueling station. She was the last survivor of the station after a devastating xenomorph infestation, but was rescued after ex-colonial marine Zula Hendricks and rogue android Davis-1 model discovered her aboard. She boarded their stolen vessel, the USS Europa, and after a short time discovered she was actually host to a queen-class xenomorph embryo. Now to reiterate, surviving a xenomorph chestburster's natural birthing process is impossible. There's no way around it. And so, the only surefire way known to get around this is through surgical removal of the chest burster in its embryonic stage. Dr. Hollis, with the assistance of her companions and the advanced medical technologies aboard the Europa, was able to pinpoint the exact right stage in the chest burster's development in which it could be most safely removed. What do I mean by this? Well, if removed too early, there is the possibility that there may still exist some raw mutagen left behind. And so, after the surgery is complete, another creature may be able to quickly gestate. This isn't exactly ideal, as you may survive the first surgery, but almost certainly not a second. If you even realise that another creature has begun to develop, there's just too much danger during this time. If you choose to operate on the host too late into the chest burster's development, then there is the chance that the embryo will mature and prematurely awaken and begin to rip its way out of the host during the very delicate procedures that need to occur. The best time to perform this extremely delicate procedure is in the middle ground, so that the mutagen has already done its work and the chest burster won't prematurely erupt and begin to attempt its birth. During this time, the host would be wise to seek out the utmost skilled medical professionals along with the most advanced medical technologies. Dr. Hollis didn't really have either, so her chances were already looking dire. However, through heavy and potent amounts of painkillers, performing the extremely delicate procedure with the highest of caution, Dr. Hollis was able to successfully operate on herself and remove her chest burster in its last embryonic stage. And while blood transfusions, extensive rounds of antibiotics and antiviral medication followed in order to allow her immune system the time it needed to rest, readjust and recover, 
Dr. Hollis, while successful in her attempt, only barely was able to survive the ordeal. And the long-term effects of such a traumatic incident are still yet to be explored in her case. As once quoted by Zula Hendricks herself, the hosts of the alien aren't really meant to survive the ordeal. However, just from this one example, we do see that in the rarest of situations, someone can indeed remove their chest burster and survive in the process. The second case we need to explore is that of the individual known as Ripley 8. Ripley 8 was a clone of the original Ellen Louise Ripley, created by the United Systems military in their effort to clone Ripley with a queen xenomorph gestating within her with samples taken from her time on the planet Fiorina 161, an off-world correctional facility. This occurred in the year 2381. However, this case in specific is actually far more unordinary than the last example. Or maybe the correct term would be extraordinary. You see, Ripley 8 was not simply a clone of Ellen Ripley. She was in fact more of a clone hybrid. During the cloning process, the Xenomorph's DNA reflex caused unforeseen effects on the genome of its host. The clones produced, therefore, were hybridized with DNA from both the human species and that of the Xenomorph. This means that while they were eventually able to create a clone close enough to Ripley, with a queen within her, both Ripley and her spawn contained a little too much of each other's DNA. But nevertheless, with their eighth attempt, the United Systems military had created what they required, a near-perfect clone of Ellen Ripley, and one of the Queen Xenomorph developing within her. Now all they needed to do was to safely extract the specimen from the host, and they would be able to eventually breed up a hive, and that they did. However, not everything went as they expected. They did not intend this Ripley 8, as they called her, to actually survive the procedure. Because that's exactly what happened. Ripley 8 not only survived the surgery that was meant to kill her, but she recovered at an unbelievable rate with seemingly no ill effect. How exactly was this achieved? Well, it can basically be attributed to Ripley 8's hybridized genetics. Through the hybridizing of the two clones, Ripley 8 was able to be near human, but also gained a few trace abilities attributed to that of the Xenomorphs, such as highly acidic blood, and most importantly of all to the purposes of this data log, a rapid and powerful healing ability. This is what allowed her to survive and recover as quickly as she did. Sadly though, to most across the middle heavens, these specific circumstances will never really play to their favour. Unless you too are a hybridized clone of an individual that was in the process of growing a Xenomorph XX121 chestburster within them. Otherwise, it seems very unlikely that this second case would ever apply to you in any way. The events surrounding Dr. Hollis's survival and successful removal of her chestburster, though, are something much more realistic to strive for. But even with that said, you need to keep in mind that you are not supposed to survive this. The Xenomorphs are all but designed to kill you in just about any interaction with them, let alone the process of their destructive and terrifying gestational development. So your chances from the get-go are already slim to none. But have hope. If you do find yourself impregnated by a chestburster, you might be lucky enough to be surrounded by the right people and the right technologies. And let's consider one more thing. While I do recommend complete and utter termination and disintegration of your specimen, if you can uh, remove it safely, you could also provide these samples to Wayland Jutani for a massive monetary reward. They will reward you with the finder's fee bonus, but only if it remains alive. Cooling the specimen in liquid nitrogen should keep it nice and fresh until the company can make the trip to retrieve their new property and your ticket to a vacation home in the lush worlds of the ICSC and out of the dirty and grim frontier. You just have to ask yourself, is the cost and potential risk to humanity worth it to you? Before you go, I wanted to let you know about the Acheron Colonial Marketplace, the one-stop shop for all Project Acheron merchandise. 
All proceeds go to fund our future endeavours under the project. So if you want to support the channel and look good doing it, pick up some Acheron merch. But what other data logs would you like to see? If you have any ideas or have any questions to be answered, please leave them in the comments or contact me directly through the Project Acheron Discord. If you enjoyed today's segment, please leave a like and share the video. And if you really want to support what we do here and gain access to a bunch of awesome rewards, consider becoming a Project Acheron channel member, like Project Director Chris Dassinger and team member Raunchy. I hope to see you all here again very soon, but until then, this is the Acheron Project, signing off.